you guys, welcome to Someone You Should Know. We're really excited to welcome you, Tara. Thank you. This is Tara Mosley, and she and her husband, Clint, have just become so dear and precious to our family. They actually are the pastors of the church here in Nashville that Johnny and I and some of our other family members attend here. And when we heard a while back that that uh, the things that Tara wrote in the book I'm going to tell you about were stirring in her, we were so excited at the opportunity to partner with her. So one of the few books that, besides our own, that we mm-hmm. wanted to get behind and publish was Tara's book, Declarations in the Desert, Life-Giving Decrees for the Dry and Dusty Valleys of Life. So we are going to tell you some about this book. We're actually going to read to you a few excerpts from here as well. But before we do, we want to just get started with Tara and hear some of her backstory. You guys are going to love the things that she's going to share with you today. And I think before we start, I just even want to pray. Yeah. Um, We we never take these things lightly. We're not just trying to put programs out there and content. We really want to give you guys things that will challenge you and, and encourage you spiritually. And, and Tara is just one of those people that's going to take you deeper in your relationship with Jesus, not just through her book, but through what she's going to share today. So Holy Spirit, we just invite you into this conversation and we pray for every single person that's going to hear this. And we ask God that you would speak um, things to their heart that would surprise them today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So we're glad you're here in our little home studio. Yeah, I love being here. (laughs) And I'm going to read just a a short um, formal bio of yours, and then we'll jump into more of the details. But Tara is a modern day reformer driven by love to see people set free. Her journey has taken her from a career as a division one soccer player to behind the camera lens (laughs) as a soccer. (laughs) <laughs> to behind the camera lens as an internationally award-winning lifestyle and wedding photographer. Her talent brought her across 54 countries through which God awoke in her the desire to see nations set free. Tara, with her husband, Clint, founded Project R12, a nonprofit which has impacted over 200,000 lives in rural Uganda. Yeah. Dara is a mother to four amazing children. They are the cutest (laughs) and lives in a small town outside of Nashville, Tennessee. She and her husband pastor His House Nashville, a church that seeks to build a pure altar of spirit and truth unto King Jesus. So welcome. And I think we want to start and jump in with a question from Mr. Wonderful. Well, yes, Tara. So we want to hear a little bit more about your roots with the Lord, your spiritual formation, um, that just before you get to that, you know, part of that Uganda story is amazing. Clint and Tara have about 10 years of Mm -hmm. ministry there and they actually got started before they were married. Yeah. Right before. Yeah. And it's truly an apostolic work that's taking place. I mean, they started a few square feet around, uh, a papaya, a banana tree. Was it a banana tree? I was trying to think, was it a papaya tree or a banana tree? And it's like just them. And it really, as Elizabeth said, it's reached over 200,000 people, but that doesn't begin to tell all of the scope and scale of it. But um, tell us a little bit about your spiritual formation of things yeah. that come to mind right now. Well, I grew up, you know, in a Christian household. I'm grateful for that. I have amazing parents. Uh, Both my parents were Olympic. My dad was an Olympic swim coach. My mom was in the Olympic trials. My brother, who's five years younger than me, was also in the most recent, not this last Olympics, but the last Olympic trials. So he swam against Michael Phelps. And so we grew up in a household uh, that really high high value for um, just self-discipline and dedication. And my parents are just phenomenal. We have a really close-knit family. We still do. They live just a mile from me. Um, and my dad is like one of my best friends. My mom is too. And so, uh, growing up, we grew up in Miami. Uh, I lived there for about eight years and then we moved up to Maine and that was probably a really formative years of my life spiritually because I got to live next door to my grandparents who, um, have been, they were very instrumental. They were flight attendants, so they flew all over the world. So very Uh, early I was exposed to how you got your 54 nations, the joys of traveling, Got to hear all their stories. You know, they went to Afghanistan before all of that was happening. And they they just got to see the beauty of these countries. So I was exposed to that very young. They are also very, very active in their church. It was an Episcopalian church. And so I think a little bit of the 
declaration book was influenced by all the liturgy and just the, the, oh, yeah. the beautiful um, value mm-hmm. of like the Nicene Creed and re- reciting mm-hmm. um, stuff like that in, in, in the church. Now, obviously, mm-hmm. a lot of it is missing the Holy Spirit. Right. But my grandparents were spirit-filled um, Episcopalians, and so they would meet in the back, and they would pray for healing. And so they'd bring, after church was over, they'd stand in a little circle, and they'd hold hands, and they would pray by name um, for healing over people that needed healing in their in their congregation. And I was sitting at, in the little, you know, pew and just listen. It was it was very impactful for my spirit to be in that, in that atmosphere. Um, and so I grew up around a lot of serving. We'd serve at Habitat for Humanity. I was a part of the hospice team at, like, age 10. Wow. I'd go and read to um, people who were getting very close to going to heaven, and I would just sit and read to them or hold their hand, wow. and Amazing. I'd make carrot juice for like I remember clearly mm. making carrot juice for some old older uh, lady who was really close to um, going home to heaven, and so it just impacted me this idea of Amazing. serving. Um, it was just part of me, and it impacted one reason why I went to Uganda, why I went to Africa, the way my life kind of developed. Yeah. But I lived in Maine for a long time, and then we moved down to Franklin. Um, and then I went to school out in, on the West coast to play soccer. Yeah. Um, cause that was just a big part of my life. I thought I was going to be a professional soccer player and I had the opportunity when I graduated, but the Lord was taking me a, a different way. And so that's kind of a little, um, backstory. I, I don't have that like moment where I was like, Oh, I'm, I know Jesus now I've always known him. It's just deepened and grown and I've known the Holy spirit more and more and yeah. more. And so it's just kind of been a, a growing process. You know, you, you get to experience other sides of the Father's heart when you're in a yeah. third world country, you mm-hmm. know, than you do here. Especially if you're in Seattle. I played soccer in um, University of Washington. I was one of the only believers on my team. Wow. And so that's a very, um, very hostile environment, honestly, yeah. to be um, a believer in a mm-hmm. Division One atmosphere. And so that took me on a different route to know the Lord in a deeper, different way than I knew him in mm-hmm. Africa. So yeah. it's just been amazing to to grow with the Holy Spirit. And it all plays a role in this book. Awesome. You know, that's what I, for 15 years of my life, that was my highest dream was to be a professional soccer player. But I too was coaxed to abandon that before <laughs> we, we got there. But I still have dreams of turning it all around. No, I forget it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I I love that. I love how God uses things from our childhood yeah. that we don't we think it's taking us one direction ends up taking us another. So how did you and Clint meet and how did you guys end up having a ministry in Uganda? Yeah, so um I met Clint right after I moved back to Nashville. And so I had been on the West Coast where I had started a photography business. It was amazing and booming. I was about to actually open an office in London and I was sitting in my room in Newport beach. Um, just got back from surfing. I had a really, I mean, it was, it was fun. Wow. It was a Newport fun beach, lifestyle. Miami, Maine, yes. Seattle. I'd been in four all corners, corners of the nation. Wow. Yeah. I'm picking and, that up quickly. And so I was sitting there, you know, and I was an English major. So England, London, uh, it's just dear to my heart from, you know, just all the, the literary just wealth that is there. And so I was going to open an office in London. I was sitting in my bedroom in Newport and I, I was talking with the Lord about it. And he was like, no, um, it's time. It's time to lay the photography down. You need to go back to Nashville. I was like, lay it down. And I was like, I just built this, this right. career, you know, and I thought that was going to be it. And I enjoy it. It wasn't like, and I was loving it. And I heard the Lord. It wasn't like super loud. It was just like a whisper. And it was like, it's time to, yeah. to go back home. And so I returned all my wedding deposits that I had for the next two years. And I packed my little car when a matter of about two months and I gave all my stuff away and I drove home and I sat in my parents' basement. There wasn't, there wasn't this grandiose plan um, from the Lord. He just said, go back Mm -hmm. home. And I was, it's you around what age at the time? I was about 24, 25. That's some (laughs) radical obedience. Yeah, it was, it was painful. It was honestly mm. painful to do mm. that, um, to come back with no plan here. And, mm-hmm. I, and if you know anything about photography, you can't just restart in a new place because you build your clients. And so basically I had just given that up and left behind all my clients and my, and my, a lot of my identity, to be honest. Yeah. Um, and so the Lord brought me back here. And then about eight months, about a year, probably after being here, I was at randomly at church, church I didn't even go to. And that's where I I saw Clint in the back row, caught my eye. <laughs> I'd actually just got done playing an intramural soccer game. I had just played two games, rushed to church, 
walk in. I'm just, you know, in my soccer stuff and I see him in the back and I was like, I'm going to go, I'm going to go stand in front of that guy and, and just see if he'll talk to me. He is good looking. I'm like, I don't know why he's in here. He doesn't look like he fits in the church, you know, back row model. Um, so I went and stood by him. He didn't talk to me, but he saw me. And then I gave him enough time where I'm like, all right, I'm just going to go. So I went and sat and then in the front and then he waited till the service was over. He came down, talked to me and he, he would love to defend himself in this time, but he's not here. But that is what happens. Yeah. You, should, you need to tell the truth why he's not here because he'll steer it his way. Exactly. I mean, he, he, it was just one of those things we both just knew. And so yeah. he had just gotten back from Uganda. I had just gotten back from Madagascar. And so we connected on just our heart for the, for the Lord and for mm. serving and for um, seeing the, the less fortunate kind of have a, a, a voice and opportunity. And we both shared uh, the same vision to support the local people, support Ugandans or support Mad people from Madagascar to change their own country. We really connected on that. It wasn't this, um, for I mean, it's really just a white savior complex that comes in yeah. where people want to like jump in and like save save people. And I understand yeah. that, but also after traveling so much, I saw that there was this giant gap between the people on the ground serving and then the um, Western or yeah. missions group. There's yeah. just a gap in it. And being a part of the, the teams for, you know, in so many different countries, it was a very universal problem. And yeah. so you were able to see that because of your photography. Yes. You're yes. able to see that multiple places. That's how just to, uh, hop on that a second it's amazing how the lord does i think you mentioned how the lord uses where we where we've been mm -hmm. and this thing it's it stuck with me even the soccer you're having to play and you're the only believer there yeah so you're learning to uh to be true to yourself and to the lord yes. so it's still it's soccer but it's still training you for spiritual yes, things and and then the photography gift is really about discovering beauty Often, probably when, uh, for the advanced photographers, it's like going to extreme places and finding beauty there. And that's exactly what you and Clint have done, what you continue to do. And so you go into this little village in Uganda and you, you, you see the photography thing is a little bit of a prophetic gift. That's probably how you recognize Clint. Just like the photography thing. Yeah. Like, I saw it. I was like, Ooh. <laughs> Okay. Anyway. Yeah, I mean, that's so powerful. I am going to put in the description of this video links to, um, if it's okay with you, yeah. to your last oh, two got to, yeah. videos. They're, they're, they're short ones, yeah, but they're about powerful. their project in Uganda. And it'll just give you an understanding of more, you, you literally be able to picture what she's talking about and how. So you guys left um, and went on a few month trip to yeah. Uganda before you even got married. And Yes. That's where it started. Tell us about that. Yeah. I would say, so both Clint and I have, um, if you were to ask what's their biggest gift, I guess you would say, it would be faith. Right. We both have just massive, massive um, gift of faith. And we so, confirm. Like when this, this whole thing, I, when Clint and I met, you know, we both kind of like combined our dream of what the Lord had both been speaking to us. And I was like, hey, I'm thinking about going back in a couple months to set this up. I've, you know, met this local leader and we're going to meet and kind of just brainstorm and pray with the Lord. And, he, and so Clint basically like laid down his job and came with me. He also liked me. Um, so there was there was motivation there. And we were both like, OK, we're going to go. We brought a team with us. We're going to go over and basically lay the groundwork for what we're currently doing. And again, the biggest thing being is we wanted to have local partners. We didn't want to go over there and have, and have um, our name on everything, plaques and all of that. There's nothing wrong with that. But the Lord was specific with us mm -hmm. into saying, basically, are you okay with building things without people knowing that you're the builder? Yeah. Are you okay having, uh, you know, schools built and wells done without your name on it, but actually giving uh, the local people there the, the like, credit and the acknowledgement yeah. so that when there's a little... 10 year old African, you know, Ugandan boy that comes to the school, he sees that his people did this and not, yeah. you know, me and Clint. And we're like, yes, like we would, we would love that. And and it's the same, even with his house, the church here in Nashville, right. our heart is not to have Clint and Tara um, or even Johnny and Elizabeth. We're not, we're not trying to create yeah. this platform, but again, it's just these altars for the Lord to in inhabit. And so yes. that's what's happened in Uganda. And yeah, we went over and we basically met with our team, um, our partners, which is led by Freddie and, the, and his yeah. whole team. And 
that, you know, they're up to 50 to 80 different um, team members now in our heart from the start. Yeah. We told them, we want to see you guys succeed. We want to see you change your own country. How can we partner with you to do that? We're not interested in getting credit for this. There doesn't yeah. need to be, you know, these long posts of like honoring us for, it's not about that. Like yeah. the Lord sees our hearts. He knows the people that are going to be giving into this are their heart is to see you advance. And yeah. so that's what's happened in Uganda. It's been acknowledged by the government. We've had uh, just unbelievable testimonies. Yeah. And like Elizabeth said, some of the ones you'll see, we've been a part of kids' lives for 10 years, which is pretty rare. Mm -hmm. We've rescued some at four or five years old. Now they're 15 or so. Um, and some of them are the top students in all of Uganda, which is just incredible. They're, they're, they're going to be the change agents within their yeah. country. And um, it's just so encouraging and so amazing to be a small part of that. Yeah. And that's just been our heart is to see freedom to nations. And how do you do that? It has to have the gospel. You have to have clean water. You have to have education. You have to have uh, vocational training projects for men and women. You have to have all these things together because if you just bring clean water, but there's no gospel and there's no school, yeah, that's great. But can we do all of it? And Clint and I believe we could. And so we tried that and it was successful. Well, I love the method you know, the strategy that God gave y'all, because it doesn't require you to be there and be right. on the ground. You're, you're here doing life yeah. here, your parents and your pastors here, and you go a couple of times a year, but, but you've got local your leadership team. is so strong yes. there. Yeah, the yes. Ugandans are running everything and, yeah. um, doing it well. And it's yeah. clear that y'all are not only investing in them financially, but investing in them spiritually. And it's given them, you know, the ability to hear from the Lord for what's happening yeah. on the ground there. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I um, am excited about this next part where we want to get into your book because yeah. it really is an overflow of yeah, where yeah. all you've been with the Lord and mm -hmm. what, what he's been doing in you personally, spiritually. Yeah. Um, Declarations in the Desert, Life-Giving Decrees for the Dry and Dusty Valleys of Life. This is an amazing, powerful book for so many reasons. But give us a little background on where this came from and what yeah. was your inspiration for, for putting declarations into a book? Yeah, so it kind of just organically happened. Being an English major, I always, it was on my bucket list to write a book. And I never, you know, envisioned it would look this way. Like when you will get this book, it's, it's almost like poetry and uh -huh. it's, it's, it's much different than I envisioned a, a book I would write, but the Holy Spirit really wrote this with me and yeah. I wrote it on runs. I would go running and I would just speak into my phone and I would have scripture playing in my ear and I would hear and I was like, oh, what a great verse to declare over my life. What a great verse to declare over my kids. And I would have people um, asking me, hey, I have a friend battling, you know, uh, they, it just seems that their life, everything is delayed. What They're like, it just seems like there's these blockages along the way. Can you pray with me? And I was like, yeah, I'll pray. But also like, let's declare these verses of living scripture into these mountains and valleys before you. And so what it just kind of organically happened and we started declaring on our little, in our little services, you know, when it was just starting in our basement, we got a little bit bigger and we just kept doing it. We just kept um, declaring because you could feel the atmosphere shift. You mm -hmm. could feel a, a tangible shift in the atmosphere because the, the, the word of the Lord doesn't return void. And so we're just making these bold declarations of truth uh, into the atmosphere we're in and it, and it changes. And so that's, that's kind of how it started. Um, at his house and we, we do it every service, whether it's me or somebody, but we just, um, make these bold decrees. And like, as you guys know, Clint's, um, injury he had was really, yeah. I would say that the Genesis for when I had this opportunity yeah. to start declaring the word of the Lord into what appeared to be a life threatening, death. yeah, life threatening yeah. injury. Yeah. So tell tell a little bit about that, just even as an example of the power of, right. of our words and yeah. what we declare. Because you had a very important declaration decree at a very key time yes. that you should tell. And I so that my my husband Clint, um, well, he had gotten uh, injured in a security training at a church, and essentially what happened is a, a someone fell on his throat and it created a perforated esophagus, which is basically like, it just like broke open. And, uh, it was very, it's very crucial with that. You can have infection within like 24 hours. It's a very intense injury and they couldn't treat him at our local hospital. So they, they 
took him in an ambulance to Vanderbilt. I had three kids. One was like three weeks old. We had one car. Um, we had no health care. So we were in these positions, which I'm sure many people have been in, where you just stepped out in full faith to do Project R12 full time as a family. Um, and so we were at this precipice where, you know, we just took the step for the Lord and the enemy is wow. just, and I knew it was attack from the enemy. I knew this was just, this was not God ordained. This was not something to teach us anything. This was straight from hell, an attack against his life. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know much about declaring or decreeing then. It wasn't like I had, you know, was just like, I'm going to go and declare it. Just, I didn't know about it. Yeah. Um, but as I was reading the word, I started to just begin to declare and decree just naturally. And it was like, Johnny will say too, it's different than praying. It has a, just a different, um, language. And so what happened, my husband was sitting in the ICU, the doctor came in and he was, said, we're going to have to, um, cut you basically like six inches from here to here, put a feeding tube in your husband's quality of life is not going to be the same. Um, there's very, a lot of complications that can happen. We're still not sure. Basically every, you know, terrible thing you want to hear was released. And so as he came into this room, um, I just felt this, this, um, almost was rising up Holy in my spirit. spirit. Rise, rose up in you. Yeah. yeah. And I just said, he started to speak and he started to say, well, and I could see on his face, this was going to be some heavy stuff. And I just told him, Hey, you need to leave this room. Like we can talk in the hallway, but I don't, we're not receiving these words over his life because he was laying on this bed defenseless and he wasn't able to say Talk anything say himself, himself, but yeah. these words were going to be released over him. And even he was pretty unconscious, but his spirit is never unconscious. Right. And so I didn't want those things released over him. I didn't want him hearing that. And we don't agree with it. And like I said, this was such a clear attack from hell mm -hmm. that I felt in that moment. I'm like, this is, I have to come up. We're one in the spirit, me and Clint, you know, we're, we're plowing together. And right now he's down and I'm going to rise up and I'm not, cause I could have partnered with all the fear, all the, the Quickly, stuff. Quickly, easily, yeah. And, and then, yeah, and then once you go down that, it's just really hard to recover. And so he, I took him in the hallway and I was just like, we don't receive that. I don't, that that's, I know you're going to see a miracle tonight. Like, and I just felt that. It wasn't like I was trying to be, you know, hyper spiritual. Right. Like, it was real. I, I felt it. I was like, the Lord is going to do a miracle tonight. You will see him healed. And then the doctor was like, whoa, honey, I think you're in shock. Is there anyone else we could call? <laughs> and so... They wanted to, I was like, I'm not in shock. Like you're going to see a miracle tonight. And, um, if you're going to release anything like that, we'll talk in the hallway. Don't go in there and speak those words over him. And so that was kind of the, the, the beginning point. And as I sat in this room, they gave us, you know, an eight foot by eight foot room for anyone who's with someone who's been sick. You know, they give you that little hospital room and I just encourage you, that's your space. Like that is where you are. You have authority in that space. And so I was playing worship music and I was reading and declaring over Clint that he will live and not die. And all these, these verses that are just so powerful, I was declaring them over him and making sure that he understood this is what heaven is saying. Like we declare this, we agree with this, we partner with this. And the temperature in the room began to change and they kept complaining, we're so sorry, it's so hot in here. And I'm like, well, my husband is being healed. Like, I, I know that it, it, you're trying to say the air conditioning broke, I can hear it. Like it's, it's raging and it's, my husband is being healed. You're going to see a miracle. And slowly you see these nurses that are beginning what was so skeptical <laughs> and just like, Oh, bless you is now like, what is happening here? And so he went back, they, they checked his throat. Um, you got to give the background because the first, um, picture that they got, yes. a, a scan showed his whole cavity was completely filled with air, which is a big deal. Yes. So it was Bad deal. very black and white in front of them, what they were yes. dealing with. Yeah. And so it was, um, his whole, yeah, he looked like he had football pads under his shoulders because it was so full of air. And when I would lay by, like sit by him and he was laying, it would be like, when you open a soda can, it's like his mouth. The air was bubbling, popping wow. up out. And so there was vast quantities of air. They didn't know how to sew him up because it's such a delicate area. It was going to, and they kept delaying. Again, this was, this was really key. It kept delaying for some reason. This is all in one day. This was all in one day. And so, you know, we got there about 8 PM and now it's about 3 AM and they should have already began the surgery because, but they kept delaying and they're like, we don't, we're so sorry. Like we're delaying. And really it was the Lord delaying right. because he was healing Clint. Yeah. And I watched him go from being on every pain medicine that they could legally give you in a hospital to slowly not needing it anymore. And I'm watching him, his like color return. 
And I'm like, you're being healed. And he's like, I'm being healed. And so he's going down the, he's going down the corridor of the hospital and he's just like praying for people as we're going down. <laughs> they're wheeling him. They're wheeling yeah. him. And he's like praying and the, the nurse, doctor, they're all just like very confused by this whole thing because he shouldn't be getting yeah, better. Well, yes. And so then he drank this, this, to uh, do one last scan, to do one more scan. And the, literally the lady, and they let me back there with him. And she jumps up out of her seat and she's like, there's no hole. There's no hole. And they are so no excited way. to see a miracle. They were just like unbelievably like just they were dumbfounded by the whole thing. And yes, the scan showed that there was no longer a perforated t- torn esophagus. Like in less than 12 hours. Yes, about 12 hours, which technically should have there should have been um, surgery within 24 because of infection. And so the delay actually was the Lord healing him. And so And it doesn't heal itself. This no, is not an injury no. that heals itself. So he was in the trauma unit at Vanderbilt, which one of the, you know, there's people in there with like life ending, life threatening injuries. And he's sitting in there on his bed, clapping his hands, and every doctor from every unit is coming in just to see him. They're looking in his throat and they're like, oh wow. They're like, you're superhuman. You have like superhero blood wow, you are so lucky. And he's like, I was healed by Jesus. This is a miracle. And they, they, they were slowly coming around to it. But then on his medical release, they put medical anomaly, which is code for miracle. Miracle. Medic- <laughs> yeah. Medical anomaly. Yes. Well, wow. And that's, that's amazing. No, so I, I, it's a great example of yeah. the power of declaration. Well, yes. yeah. And let me just go into that. Now, doesn't that, as we look, talk about this book, Declarations in the Desert, does that not let's see if I put it where it can be seen? Well, y'all know you'll you'll see it there. But doesn't that change everything to know a little bit about the author? It's like what was Psalms? Why is Psalms so powerful for? <clears throat> yeah, it's in what's said, yeah. but it's David who experienced the Lord at so many different levels. Yeah. And you've just heard a little bit of Tara's personal story and things she's got. When she talks about declarations in the desert, you can look at her and go, that she doesn't look like she's ever been in the desert. <laughs> Honestly, if you look at her, you'd like, she's what well, she's hadn't hardly lived like at all. And she's been in 54 nations and has lived un, in, in the desert and had multiple other severe tests here and in the nations. And so that tells you that you're going to get some life. Whatever she would write, you'd want to, uh, you, you'd want to read it. But these declarations are truly life-giving, as it says, life-giving giving decrees for the dry and dusty valleys of life. And so there are over 90 decrees mm-hmm. across four distinct desert seasons. And oh, yeah. It's really Do you wanna... cool how she breaks it down. Well, and you may want to tell about those those distinct desert uh, seasons. But just on the matter of decrees, I don't really have to say that much more about them. She's kind of made the case for it already. Like you actually go and you, you know, the way Clint tells it, I, I even like it better on that part. Um, it was like. Basically, Tara told the doctor to hush his mouth, and if he wanted to say this stuff, he can go outside. Can you imagine going into a hospital and doing that? That was a decree as well, though, because you had to shut the mouth of, of doubt. So there's, there are decrees that, ha- that have to come out sometimes to hush what the enemy is trying to release. Mm-hmm. But then to try to establish God's narrative in the midst of that scenario, how many of you know that that takes uh, some spiritual guts, and that's what's what took place. So Everything she, uh, um, and I've read many of these, and, and that she has, she has shared that, you know, it'll be in the middle of going through a test with, um, there, we could take another 10, 15 minutes just to tell you about how special their four little kids are. They're, <laughs> they're amazing. You can see both of them are, they march to the beat of another drum, and their kids do already, but they've had unique tests as well. And so she just goes to the Lord, and out of it comes um, something, whether it's for them or uh, you know, standing in the gap for people in the church as well. So declarations, decrees, powerful. And there's something about this year as well. I just feel to add that. Mm-hmm. Um, there is something has been released by the Lord. Uh, you know, I don't know, the gavel from heaven and order on behalf of the saints. And in a major way that we um, activate our kingship, you know, he is the king of kings. We are the kings under that. A major way we activate our kingship and the power he has given us is by agreeing with him and then declaring that. Yeah. And it literally is life-changing. It changes. It shifts things. It's it's not just, you know, well, it's good for your, some psychological, it's that too. 
but it's a power weapon that releases something. So this is really an awesome work there. You know, I grew up in the era where there was the faith movement, where it was the whole name it and claim it thing. And you just, if you, you know, my mom was sick with cancer and there was this feeling like if you, if you say it wrong, if you don't acknowledge the truth or if you acknowledge the truth of a you know situation with health or whatever, then you're going to jinx it and then God can't move. So we're not talking about that. Right. We're talking about the power of when our words match up with what God is doing. Mm-hmm. And so we're not using declaration to try to convince God of something. Right. Yes. We're, we're using declaration. How would you say we're using declaration? Well, I, to me, uh, it's agreeing just with the promises that are within the living word. And, you know, it doesn't mean one of the things with declarations is you don't have to say it with all this faith. Honestly, you can just declare it. And that's one reason I wrote this is because there's some seasons of life when you need hope and you literally you, you've you lost it, it. To, yeah. to even have the faith for hope anymore. Mm-hmm. And one of my desires is that you can just read this out loud, even if you don't fully believe it in that moment. But like Johnny said, these are, this is the living scripture. And the way that um, the Holy Spirit wrote this with me is it's really unique. There's like a cadence to it and it's just different. Um, It's a different book. I would say it's almost like a a wartime handbook. Mm. Um, Well said. Yeah. Yeah. Even like the ones I've honestly almost experienced every one of these decrees in my life because I've been in so many places and even having kids like overnight terrors. I remember when I went to the pediatrician and she's like, Oh, that's a normal development stage for a child. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, it's not normal. And I don't receive that over, over my daughter because she's a, she was very in tune with the spirit. She's very sensitive to dreaming and visions. And I was like, the enemy is trying to attack that and scare her. And so there's a a declaration in here over night terrors that I would begin to declare over her, like over the beauty of her imagination and her mind. And it wasn't that like I was trying to convince God of anything, but I was just declaring the word of the Lord over her and releasing it from a place of purity and just offering it over her life. Well, and you say, um, just quoting or stating the word. And again, I believe the Lord, it's credit to us as faith, just to be able to say something when we don't yeah. feel it. Yeah. It's like, I believe, help my unbelief. And so exactly. you, you just, yes. you, you go with it. So that, that gets credited to you as faith stepping into it. But what makes it different, it's not like, that's why we're going to give you a couple examples here. It's not just um, reading her, restating the scripture. There's a personalized component mm-hmm. of this based on what she's gone through, based on the battle she's experienced. Yeah. So, which is what happens with uh, David as well in the Psalms is there's a, there's a personalized experience uh, that he's, he's gone through and, and uh, you were, I think you're going to give it, but let me tell a couple of uh, just like the topics. Um, so over, ang- over anxiety for healing over trauma, my voice has value over death, uh, Lyme disease, the fear of man, tumors and cysts. You can think there's there's something that she is facing personally. So a declaration that agrees with scripture and that scripture will apply and you'll see scripture woven into it. Mm-hmm. But there is this personalized, it's a rhema. If you know the difference between a rhema word and a logos word, it's not just something that's written that is powerful, but it has been activated through someone grabbing a hold of it for a specific moment. And it really is yeah. powerful. I think it, we're gonna... I love how you put the scripture references mm-hmm. at the bottom of each one. Oh yeah. And can you just speak into the four different, um, yeah. distinct desert seasons and, and yeah. give us a few more teasers of from each one. Maybe you could even pick one to, to read. Yeah. yeah. So the, the map, like there's the front, um, the map through the desert, all of this was from the Holy spirit in the sense when I was asking him, how do you want to lay this out? Because again, all these decrees, someone's either asked me about this particular topic or I've faced it myself. And even like Johnny was saying, um, just the fear of man, like yeah. releasing a declaration over, over that and declaring, um, declaring that is powerful. Like he said, even if you don't fully mm-hmm. have the faith for it, just the act of doing it. And um, so it takes you through this valley of health, which there's quite a few in here because as we know, our health yeah. has, if it, Been if you weren't assault. fearful of your health over the last two years, like the last two years is only, I've noticed increased people, like yes. you know, your fingers hurting and then you're getting afraid right. and it's just been released in the atmosphere. And so this, 
this um, Valley of Health just deals with so many different things that we've come against, even shame um, to feel again. So many people have become numb and they're just like, I can't, I can't seem to hear the Lord. I just feel numb to feel again is one blood disorders being forgotten. If, if anything COVID has done to you, there's uh, it's just this people feel forgotten. They feel like their voice has no value. And so yeah. there's de declarations to, to remind our own spirits mm -hmm. of what the Lord actually says about how you are not forgotten. Mm -hmm. um, and so it takes you on this valley of health. And then as if you picture yourself in this desert setting, uh, which I know a lot of us have been in this wilderness desert season, you come across, you think it's just, I can't walk anymore. I'm exhausted. And then all of a sudden you see this oasis. And it's like you get to go and just sit at this oasis and drink of the living waters. And so that that um, section just has all these things that remind us, all these different topics that remind us of who God is and just his power. And it's it's just a different experience than being in this valley of health. And then it takes you up to the mountains of life, those times when you're going and you're doing okay. And then you see this giant, this giant, you know, delays. You see culture. Mm. You feel like, wow, I don't know how I'm going to climb this mountain. And these are some declarations over those areas of even God warring for us. We have to be reminded mm. and declaring that. I guarantee you that like that, that declaration, God warring um, for me, or even the essence of the kingdom. If you're in this place of sadness or depression and feel defeated, mm -hmm. just opening your mouth, declaring that or picking up your phone. Yeah. And this is something I really love that I didn't even plan on this. Or I've gotten feedback from people is they'll have someone text them like, hey, can you pray for me? And they'll find a decree in here that aligns with something that they're going through mm -hmm. and they just record it and they record it and they're like, wow, that was, and then what no, happens is the Lord opens prayer within them. And so after this declaration, they've been all of a sudden are able to pray mm -hmm. how they didn't realize they were able to pray because it's just opening, like yeah. you're saying heaven. And it's so, so good. Yeah. And then it comes down to the manna in the wild, which is just the promises of God. Um, like my friend, the Holy spirit, joy, adoration, the Royal priesthood. And then, um, awesome. Yeah, so it's just it's just this really pretty beautiful journey through a hard area with all these different refreshment places from the Lord that are built into these wilderness seasons in our lives. Yeah, and read so powerful. Uh, read one of well, they're all your favorites, but just read, <laughs> read one yeah. of your favorites. I'll read I'll read this one um, that Clint and I both love because we read this often. It's a declaration of strengthening in the Lord. It kind of applies to all areas of our life. and At all times. Yeah, at all times. And as, as you'll see, if you get the book, it's laid out into stanzas. And so you don't even have to read the whole de declaration. Right. Even just like parts, they'll speak to your spirit and, and you'll just know. And so I'm just going to read a little portion of it. Um, I declare he leads, he rescues, and he protects. And he gives me eternal victory through the blood of the lamb and the word of my testimony. I declare his strong right arm covers me as he pours out his unmatched strength upon me, his beloved and courageous one. It's just that perfect, like that example, it's just to be reminded that you are his beloved and courageous one. And like Elizabeth mm -hmm. said, there's scripture at the bottom that you can go and actually read mm -hmm. and you can write your own declarations or you can just read the verses. Um, but I'll continue with this one. I speak to my inner man to be strengthened by his spirit. And to operate with power, unlimited as the boundless glory and wonder of his divine, all-powerful nature. This next stanza is, is, I read this over my kids, and I remind them, it's just so powerful. And so I'll just read this next little part. I declare within my birthright is the weapon of courage. Courage like Daniel to stand when all other others bow. Courage like Joshua to trust when all others doubt. Courage like Deborah to rise up when all others cower. I declare the words of David over my destiny. Be strong and courageous and take action. Do not fear nor be dismayed for the Lord God, my God is with you. I declare that I am strong. I stand firm. My resolve comes from him and him alone. Wow. So powerful. I um, want to read. Too. Yeah, I want to read decree to persist and finish. And, you know, maybe some of you guys can relate to mm. this. You've got, you know, things in your life that you just need to follow through on. I declare a fresh breath of holy endurance mm. fills your lungs, a desire to persist in cheerful mm. steadfastness, no matter the course, no matter the road, no matter the obstacles. I declare the Lord of heaven's army speaks a word of encouragement over your life. Be strong and finish the task. I decree yes, unto the one who sits in the heavens. 
a tenacity of spirit lives within you because of him, inspiring you to run, to persist, and to finish the race set before you. There's more to it, but there's just so many <laughs> powerful nuggets in here. Well, let me... You got one you want to read? Yeah, let me I'll just read part of one as well. Decree of a promise. Mm. I declare he is faithful, faithful to fulfill the promise. Mm. Exclamation point. I declare to the lies, listen to this, I declare to the lies wrapped in the whisperings of the minutes, the days, and the years. That's what I'm saying. This is beyond just reading scripture. This has, uh, it's been dipped into the unique experiences Tara's had in her spirit with the Holy Spirit. I declare to the lies wrapped in the whisperings of the minutes, the days, and the years. Anybody identify with that? He who promised is faithful. He who promised is faithful. I declare my spirit holds rightly, tightly to the one who knit me in my mother's womb. I heard his voice as he called to me, imparting to my spirit plans of prosperity, hope, and a future. I declare he is faithful to fulfill the promise. I declare my promise is wrapped in unwavering hope in the Lord, renewing my strength and lifting me to soar on wings like eagles. I declare I will continue to walk in the peace of the promise. Weariness will not control me. And that's about half of the decree overall. But that was just so rich um, right there. Those, these are examples, again, with the scriptures below where she will say extra, her spirit extracted it, it from there. But the, the really, I want to say that again. There's just a unique way of how she's experienced the Lord. And you're benefiting, yes, from scripture, but you're benefiting from her walk with the Lord that's coming to strengthen you as well as it begins to res resonate, reverberate with your with your own spirit. So, so good. Is yeah. there anything else you want to tell them about the book or about the power of declarations? Yeah, just even in reference to that one Johnny read, uh, a lot of us have been given a promise from the Lord. Uh, and maybe, like he said, it's been wrapped in the whisperings of the minutes, the days that, hey, this isn't really going to happen. This isn't going to happen. And I personally experienced it, which is, I think, one reason um, this that particular declaration. But I've also had friends who have been believing for children for years and years mm. and years. And I actually wrote this particular declaration for a friend who's been waiting eight or nine years for a baby. And um, I wanted her to read it over herself each day. And so every single one of these is, is coming from a real life moment. Yes. It was birthed out of real life. And one thing I will add is... is some of the ones over sickness, um, I've had a quite a long uh, battle with sickness, my probably 20, really going on like 20 something years. And so this doesn't come from a place of like, I just declared it and, and I had all this faith and it just happened. Like mm -hmm. I'm, I, I have been doing this for a long time. And I think some of the things that people, I know we get frustrated when we don't see the healing or happen right away, or we don't see, we don't wanna be disappointed. And I just, I just encourage you to just keep declaring, even if you can't see it yeah. um, in that exact moment. And a, a lot of times when I'm having like a, a flare up of sickness and I'm laying in my bed and I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm hurting, I'm sick. I, I can barely function. I picture myself where I am seated, where we are seated as, as sons and daughters of, of the King in a heavenly place. And like Johnny's saying, a declaration, a decree, they are, a, a, they are an actual um, edict coming. And so I'm sitting up in that place and I'm releasing this decree. I'm not sitting in my bed, this just heap of, you know, just laying there suffering. I'm sitting in a heavenly yeah. place and I'm declaring these things over myself, over my physical body, over my life. And so it comes from a place of victory and not from a place of, of suffering, even though in the natural I want right. to be there. I always picture myself there. Um, seated next to Jesus, seated up there, um, releasing these decrees. And so I encourage you, if you're in a yeah. really hard place, to kind of when you, you just remember the authority that you carry and you remember that things can change very quickly. No, and that's so good what you're saying there, because even uh, for those who are like, oh, I would have a hardest time if I'm not feeling good. How do I get to the seated in heavenly places? Well, there was an earlier decree on strength to your spirit. So you can get a decree so you can get to the healing decree. And so <laughs> these things um, really do uh, work together. So this well, is I amazing, think, Tara. I think the biggest challenge of life is also the primary purpose of life, which is to hold on to the knowledge of God. Mm -hmm. Habakkuk 2.14 we talk about all the time is 
where everything is headed. So the knowledge of the glory of God, how the the nuanced ways of all the ways that God is good and is faithful and he's he's loving, he's kind, his true character and his true nature, that is what is going to fill the earth. And if filling the earth, how much more so our own hearts. And the battle that we each personally face is the same battle that we collectively face over the earth right now, which is over the knowledge of God. Mm -hmm. And so when we declare words that reflect the true character and the true nature of God, we are not only aligning ourselves with the truth, but, you know, the results are almost the secondary plus or the win. Right. The 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 win is when we stay in alignment with the true character and nature of God, when we stay in alignment with who we know God to be. Whether we see the results of exactly. it on this side or not, it is accomplishing things in us and in the spirit realm. And so whether you get the victory like you did with Clint, right. you know, immediately or yeah. you get it years down the road, it was all sown in faith right. and it was all sown towards the thing, literally the only thing that matters for all of eternity, which is who he is right. and everything around us from our personal circumstances to things going on in the world are constantly being fueled by the lies of the enemy. And we have to, you know, raise up within ourselves and and stand in the truth and the way you do that is the rudder of your soul it's your mouth it is your tongue and it's life and um, death and the power of the tongue truly truly and i believe that you are going to hear countless 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 stories of people declaring from the pages of this book testimonies of what God does, not just in people's hearts, but literally change in the things that they're declaring over. And so I love that on your website, you have a place for people Mm -hmm. to put in testimonies, testimonies, stories. What did they, not just, did you like the book or not, but like, what, what did you see shift and change when you use this? And I think another way that people can contribute on the website through that same, you know, way is Tell how you're using the declarations. Like, I love the idea about people recording when mm-hmm. someone asks for prayer. You know, don't just say, yeah, I'm praying for you, but actually pray for them and utilize yeah. the declarations here. If you're a worship leader, this is a handbook you can use in the midst of worship. The Holy Spirit may lead you to a particular declaration. Lyrics you know, all over the place. Between mm-hmm. songs, declare it out. Um, I know that we do that at his house. Um, and What's that website? We're, well, I was going to share another oh, you're gonna, idea. Okay, okay, yeah. okay, okay. <laughs> another idea is, like you said, you know, over your children. And I love mm-hmm. how even as your children are learning to read, um, Baylor, your daughter, yeah. she's got, you gave her her yeah. own copy and she okay. highlights in there, you know, her favorite ones. Mm-hmm. And and they're learning by literally what you have written. And Yes. That just reminded me something that's really powerful for parents that have teenagers uh, I had a couple friends give the book to teenagers, um, and it, it may it may surprise you if handing it to one of your teenagers and giving them the opportunity to read it themselves, because there might be things that they're going through that they don't know how to, to tell, talk yeah. to you about or mm-hmm. even want to admit. But within here, there's some of the major attacks that are going on, yeah. especially a fear of dying. Um, just yeah. that spirit of death, fear, uh, anxiety, depression. Yeah. There's some really powerful decrees. And I had a mom send me some pictures, uh, just like she took a couple like snapshots of her daughter's uh, book and she had bookmarked the most, um, you know, the ones about fear of dying yeah. and anxiety wow. and the, and she was reading them and her mom had no idea that was yeah. maybe even something. But so I say that so uh, as just a testimony of mm-hmm. it being to speak to all generations. It doesn't have to be just for adults. It's not just for women. It's for men and women. For it's sure. For families. Yeah. And like Elizabeth was saying, every single time, and this is on the back of the book, but every time you open your mouth, every time you speak, there are only two kingdoms. Clint loves to say this. There's no spiritual Switzerland. You know, <laughs> it's either we're either agreeing with heaven or agreeing with hell. And so that is one of the big things with this is how to be in a, hor- a hard, hard time and not partner with hell, but partner with heaven, even though you can't so see good. the results yet. 
So good. Okay, yeah. so how can they find the book? Okay, so you can get the book on declarationsinthedesert.com. And we're offering free shipping right now. We we have we're packing it in our living room. We're praying over each book. Baylor, who is my now seven year old, she loves to pray over each book. And we do family. We do ministry as a family. Like this has my name on it, but it's really it's really has a part of my whole family. My husband. We all have um, all our experiences have played a role in this. Mm -hmm. And even though we haven't, there isn't. The Lord was very specific in not putting my personal experiences in here. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very focused on what the mm -hmm. decrees are on. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's it's personal to us, yeah. but it's also personal to you because right. you can make it into what you're facing. And so you can get it on declarationsinthedesert.com. And we would love, like Elizabeth said, if it's impacted you, love to share the, a testimony yeah. on the website. And we're just, I'm excited to see what the Lord's going to do. Yeah, and these will be great gifts, obviously, for other people, too. Yes. So you can also um, find it on our bookstore, restore7.org. But once you click on the book in our bookstore, it's going to take you to her site. So you're still going to be ordering directly from her. And we're so proud of you, Tara. And just we your are. thankfulness to the Lord and to, you know, this this um, this book that you birthed with him. And really excited to partner with you in it and Thank can't you. wait to hear the stories that come in from you guys yeah so declarations de in the desert dot com right. and yep. if you misspell it you'll just declarations in the desert <laughs> but that says declarations in the desert dot com right. see I just helped you remember that better yep okay go one ahead. S <laughs> why don't you pray over everybody before we yeah. finish up all right, Jesus, Lord, we just thank you for every person that is watching this, God, that you would remind them yeah. of the power and authority they carry simply as being sons and daughters yeah. of your kingdom, yeah. and that you would uh, just move on people's hearts to hear your voice, God, to move on their hearts to be filled with courage, yes. to be filled with uh, joy and peace. God, we break every lie of the enemy that has been spoken over each person, that they can't hear your voice or that they're not qualified to be able to declare, decree, or even pray big prayers. Lord, I thank you for just wiping away those lies and that those uh, the, the lies of the enemy and that they would um, be just filled with your spirit right now. God, we thank you for uh, just miracles and healings mm -hmm. and faith being restored. Lord, I yes. thank you that your word is living. We just agree and we just stand in agreement that your word is living and that it goes forth and accomplishes what you have said it to do, God. And it's not in our own works. It's not in how loud we yell these degree, decrees or even how much faith we have, but it is in your living word, Lord. And I thank yeah. you for moving, God. I thank you for moving now. And Lord, that you would just continue to minister to um, hurting people, Jesus, through these decrees and that you would fill each person here with your spirit and, and power and authority to declare, even in, no matter how dark the storm is, no matter how dusty the desert is or how long you've been there, that you would be filled right now with his spirit and his thank power you, to continue to believe, to continue to keep walking in faith. We thank you, Jesus. We give you all the glory and the praise and the honor. Amen. 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 We'll see you Amen. next time on Someone You Should Know. Mm -hmm.